Well, good morning. It's great to be with you all today. If you'll turn, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, while you're turning. In 1982, 1982, I turned 13 years old. And also one significant memory of that year for me is there was a big nationwide event that took place. And it was promoted by such luminary establishments as 7-Eleven. Um, and this event was the broadcast on television of a 3D movie. And this 3D movie was Revenge of the Creature, which is, of course, the kind of movie that a teenage boy wants to see. Uh, and so it was Revenge of the Creature in 3D. But uh, my parents had to go buy me some 3D glasses from 7-Eleven. And the deal, I think, was if you get a big gulp and a pizza, you get the 3D glasses for free as part of this promotion. So I got those glasses, and I was so excited, and one lens was green, and the other lens was, was uh, red. And so, and it was these cheap cardboard glasses. They didn't last long. So I come home, and I'm excited, and then here comes the night of the event. And now we had, did not have cable TV back then. I know this is hard for the kids here to understand, but we had rabbit ears. And I was the rabbit ear adjuster, you know, on the TV. But we adjusted the rabbit ears. This movie came on. And so I'm sitting there. I put my 3D glasses on. I couldn't get my parents to, to buy into the 3D glasses for themselves, but that's fine. So I sat there in that rocking chair, and I watched Revenge of the Creature. I must admit that it was kind of overhyped based on the actual quality of the movie. Uh, but what do you expect for a movie called Revenge of the Creature? But... Uh, but seeing the movie, that was the first time I've ever watched a movie in 3D. And it was interesting because it opened up a whole new literal dimension to, to uh, what you can view. And I believe that today, most people are going around our world today, living proverbially and metaphorically speaking, in a 2D reality. When in, when in reality, we live in a multi-dimensional universe. Many people go through life being impressed by God's creation, but not focusing on the creator. And so what I want to talk to you today about is I want to encourage you to have a 3D view of reality. I want you not just to look at the impressive aspects of the universe and our world, but I want you to look at the God who is behind it. And so today we're going to look at Hebrews 11, the first three verses, Hebrews 11. And, and I want to read them to you right now, reading in the New King James Version. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, this is the verse that we're going to look at today, uh, but unfortunately, i got to crank up my uh, image viewer here because it's, it's all faded on me. So, um, if you look at the, uh, the meaning of these words here, by faith means belief or trust, if you look at the Greek behind that word faith. Um, and this is not a secret kind of faith. I know it's, it's, it's tempting when you read the, the wonderful stories of the men and women of Hebrews 11, and we read the whole chapter last week, it's so easy for us to think, well, that's fine for Abraham and Sarah. That's fine for those great heroes of the faith, for Moses. But I'm not Moses. I'm not Abraham or Sarah. I am just me. And, you know, so it's fine for the heroes of the Bible to have great faith, but please don't expect that of me. If God wants me to have great faith, then why didn't he give me the same faith that he gave those great patriarchs and heroes of the past. I got two things to tell you on that. One, if you actually read the Bible, you will notice that these great heroes of the faith didn't always have strong faith. You will notice that oftentimes they were weak in their faith, and oftentimes they struggled, just like you and I do. You know, Abraham put his pants on. Well, he didn't put pants on, but he put, he, he's the same kind of, he has a, he's a human being, a flesh and blood human being just like you and I are, and Abraham struggled. Abraham lied about his wife twice. Twice. 
And so, you know, these are not like these unapproachable people. They're human beings just like you and me. We have a tendency to turn the people of the Bible into these impersonal statues that we can never appreciate fully. But these, these, their stories are in canonized scripture for us so we can be inspired by them and learn from them. But not only that, this is not a secret kind of faith. Verse 3, verse 3 here, which we're focusing on today, makes it very clear that this faith is available to all of us because we live in the same world that these people lived in. And the basis of their faith in Hebrews 11 was that they saw not just the creation, but they saw the creator. And you and I can do the same thing. We live in a world today full of cynicism and doubt and desperation and anxiety. And many Christians are swept up in that because we just focus on our circumstances rather than the one who is sovereign over our circumstances. We focus on our problems rather than the greatest problem solver of all time. We focus on our sickness rather than the greatest healer, the person that is the great physician. We focus on everything that is wrong sometimes in our life and all the things that can cause us stress and anxiety rather than focusing on the one who can bring hope and healing and does bring hope and healing to hearts and homes. And so today I want you to really look at that creator today as we as we understand this. And this is something that is approachable for every person here. It says that we understand by by this faith. We understand. Now, it doesn't say we create and there are some professing Christians that I think have twisted the faith teachings of the Bible to kind of be basically, well, if I believe something strong enough, I can create it. You and I are not the creators. We're not the creators. And what this teaches is not that we can create something out of nothing, but that by faith we can better understand the one who can create something out of nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in God's cathedral. We live and we are in the very presence of a miracle. We are surrounded by miracles every day. And it's our faith that allows us to truly understand and appreciate those miracles and the wonders of creation. And that is what can power up your prayer life. You are not just throwing prayers against some abstract, you know, force of the universe. You're not just praying to the universe. And please tell me you're not doing that. And they, there are celebrities that talk about, I just pray to the universe and I trust the universe to give me. I don't trust this universe. I trust the creator of this universe. And that is who you need to pray to is the creator of this universe. The word understand means to perceive, one commentator said, to perceive with reflective intelligence. So this is not a, a silly, shallow, superficial, blind faith. Well, I just believe, you know, and just kind of have your, your you know, nose in the sky and you're just kind of oblivious and skipping through life. That is not the kind of faith that we're called to. And that's not the kind of faith that's praised here. Rather, it is a faith that's reflective and it's intelligent. It is smart. And one of, the, one of the things we're going to really drill down on today in this message is it makes a lot of rational sense to see all the evidence around and conclude, yeah, God is real. He is not a figment of your imagination or my imagination. The uh, verse goes on to say the world's. The Greek word behind this is aeonis, and it's actually the same word we get the word eons from. So it's not just worlds like uh, Earth and, and Mars and Venus and Pluto, which should still be considered a planet, in my opinion. All right? I am still not happy about that. Pluto matters. So anyway, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have, uh, it's not just talking about those kinds of worlds. It's actually a very, it's a word in the Greek that's a grand word. It's like it, it refers to basically all of reality. One commentator wrote, the celestial world with its inhabitants, the angels, the starry and ethereal worlds with all that is in them, the sun, the moon, the stars, the fowls of the air, the terrestrial world, 
with all upon it, men, beasts, and the watery world, the sea, and all that is therein. And then it says framed, um, and this is actually um, has the has the um, uh, implication in the text of of the world is custom made. It's tailor made. And and I'm not an expert in science, but you can go and and talk to anyone who is, and they will tell you that everything from the, the nature of gravity to the amount of oxygen that we have to the way that the that our uh, you know that we're protected by basically a force field around our atmosphere around this planet to the distance that our planet is from the sun everything is perfectly aligned and perfectly in balance to make life on earth possible that if you just adjusted some of these uh, readings or some of these dials, if you can picture a bunch of dials, if you just adjusted them a little bit, we would cease to exist. Now, you're going to tell me that's all by random chance? And this, this, this book makes it clear here, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that everything was framed. It was fitted just so we could be here. It was fitted for the purposes of God. And it was done by the word of God. Now, the translation for this, this word, word, <laughs> is rima. It's a little bit different than in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the word, capital W, and that is referring to Christ. But this, in Hebrews 11, the writer here is talking about the word, small w. It's referring to the actual spoken utterance of the Creator. So John focuses on the Creator, and the writer of Hebrews here focuses on what the creator spoke, what the creator said. All right, so that's a little bit of a different twist. But it's basically saying that it's God's divine utterance that brought all of this into existence. Uh, and uh, Charles Spurgeon said this about it. Creation was the fruit of a word. Jehovah said, light be, and light was. The Lord's acts are sublime in their ease and instantaneousness. What a word is this? This was the wondering inquiry of old, and it may be ours to this day. He commanded, and it stood fast. Out of nothing, creation stood forth and was confirmed in existence. The same power which first uplifted now makes the universe to abide. Although we may not observe it, there is as great a display of sublime power in confirming as in creating. Happy is the man who has learned to lean his all upon the sure word of him who built the sky. Things which are seen. That means obviously visible things or observable realities. It's the realities that we can see, touch, taste, feel, hear, and smell. Things that we can apprehend with our senses. But they were not made of things which are visible. So the things that we can touch with our senses and apprehend with our senses were not made by things that we can apprehend with our senses. That's what Hebrews here 11.3 is saying. This indicates that the invisible is responsible for the visible. Now, before you just kind of dismiss this, well, that's just Bible talk. That's just pastor talk. Da, da, da. Let me take you and quote from NASA. All right, and NASA, just so you know, is not a church, okay? Um, NASA writes this, more is unknown than is known. We know how much dark energy there is because we know how it affects the universe's expansion. Other than that, it is a complete mystery, but it is an important mystery. It turns out that roughly 68% of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter makes up about 27%. The rest, everything on Earth, everything ever observed with all of our instruments, all normal matter, adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Come to think of it, maybe it shouldn't be called normal matter at all, since it is such a small fraction of the universe. Now, this is NASA confirming something that should be obvious. But what we see is a small fraction of the reality that is out there. 
physicists, especially experts in quantum physics and quantum mechanics and all of that, will tell you that there are likely up to 11 different dimensions to reality itself. That gets into interdimensional stuff beyond just the, the dimension that we live in and inhabit. Even in this dimension that we're in, or dimensions that we're in right now, we only apprehend about 5% of reality. You go beyond that, there's more dimensions. And this is something that, that all scientists, Christian and non-Christian, will admit and confirm. And I want you to let this sink in here, because, hear me on this, this I'm going to say two things that, that I, you guys are, most of you are smarter than I am, okay, which is, I know, a low bar, but you can get this, okay? So, understand that science, scientists are saying, we don't see dark matter and dark energy, but we see the effects of those things, and therefore we deduce from the effects of those things that those things exist. Let me repeat that. We don't see dark matter and dark energy or these other dimensions, but we see the effects of these things, therefore we can accurately deduce that these things exist even though there's mystery to it. Talk to any scientist and they will, they will agree what I just said. So here's my question, especially to those scientists who are more in the agnostic or atheist camp, and there are a few. Not as many as you think, though, but there are a few. Uh, if you're willing to say that you can conclude that there are things that we can't see because of the effects, then what's your problem with believing in a creator? It's the same reasoning that we use ourselves to conclude, you know what? We can't see God, but we can see God's effects, Therefore, we know God exists. It's the same reasoning, the same rationale. And so the second thing I want to say to you is this. It's not like the atheists and agnostics have their evidence over here. And we Christians, we have our evidence over here. No. We are looking at the same evidence. We just come to different conclusions. The same evidence. So I look at the impressive universe that we inhabit, and I look at it, and to me, it is plainly obvious that there is an intelligent designer at work behind this universe. So it's fine if you aren't willing yet to go there. That's between you and the creator. I don't believe in a creator. Creator still will, is still there whether you believe in him or not. Uh, but you're like, well, I don't believe, okay. We'll pray for you until you get there. But please don't look at the rest of us who do believe in a creator and think that we're foolish and somehow you're brilliant. Um, there was a guy, um, by the way, just again, what, what, it, what is seen helps us understand and appreciate better what is unseen. And if you focus only on what is seen, then you're living in a 2D world. Your reality is flat. I'm encouraging you to put your 3D glasses on and see reality in its multidimensional nature. There was an atheist named Dr. Doug Borschman. He was a chemist, and he had a profound interest of all things in the eye. He became an expert in the eye. He especially was, made a lot of contributions to the field of cataract surgery. So Dr. Borschman... Uh, just began to contemplate the eye. And he began to contemplate it. And he realized the eye has more than 2 million working parts. This is just your eye. 2 million working parts. The human eye is capable of seeing resolution at 576 megapixels. I guess that's good. I, I don't know. So. Corneas are the only tissues in your body that don't require blood. The eye can process 36,000 bits of information an hour. That sounds impressive. The eye blinks 10,000 times a day. By the way, if your eye didn't blink, that would be a serious problem. And keep in mind that your brain is programmed in such a way that you don't have to tell your eyes to blink. There's a lot of things that you don't have to tell your body to do that it does. It's like, for example, you don't have to decide to breathe. You just breathe naturally. But imagine if you forgot that. 
We'd have a very interesting church service this morning if that was the case. And uh, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, tell your eye to blink. Okay, blink, blink, blink. You don't have to do that. It just does it naturally, both of them. Under the right conditions, the human eye can see the light of a candle at a distance of 14 miles. The eye can see 2.7 million different colors or shades of colors. That's pretty impressive. The eye has about one, excuse me, 12 million photoreceptors. These are light sensitive cells, so cells, cells that are light sensitive and function as photoreceptors. The retina contains 130 million rods for night vision and 7 million color sensitive cones for day vision. Dr. Borschman became a Christian. He was an atheist, and he reflects on all this, and nah, that didn't come about by random chance. Even Charles Darwin, even Darwin wrote this, that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Darwin said that. All of this reflects what the apostle, hold your place in Hebrews 11 and turn to Romans chapter 1. All of this reflects what Paul gets at in his letter to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I want you to understand that I've heard some people say, if you had one question to ask God, what would it be? And some atheists and agnostics that I read have said, I would ask why he didn't provide more evidence of his existence. And this just leads me to think, what do you want? What, what do you want? Well, I want God to speak audibly from heaven. He's done that. I want God to come down to earth on his own and talk to me. He's done that. I want God to inspire prophets and people for a, He's done that. You look through the Bible and God has communicated to the human race in every conceivable way. And we live in God's wondrous creation where you can look at the complexity of the eye and the complexity of the human body alone. And you can clearly see intelligence behind that, a design behind that. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's a thought, a thought requires a thinker. If there's a design, that design requires a designer. And people are like, I don't have enough evidence. What more do you want? And the reality is, and I know this, is, this sounds harsh because people are going like, to dispute this, but here's the reality. Human beings suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We see the evidence for God plainly. But for a variety of reasons, many people just don't want to go there. And so they suppress that. They suppress what they don't want to face. That is a very unhealthy way to live in general. Many people will suppress past pain so they don't have to deal with it. Well, that pain has a way of popping up in other areas of your life and making things very difficult. If you want to get over your pain, you got to put it right in front of you and you got to deal with it. 
Maybe you need help dealing with it, but you got to deal with it. Don't live your life in ignorance or trying to escape reality or trying to avoid things. Face it. So there have been many scientists over the years that have suppressed the truth of unrighteousness, but many Christians today have this, have this impression that most intelligent people don't believe in God. And I'm telling you, the record of history does not show that. In fact, there's a lot of scientists today that are Bible-believing Christians. And even many who are not Bible-believing Christians at least would look at you like you have like six heads if you said there's no God. And so we know that God exists because we see the evidence for him. I'm going to give you just a few quotes from scientists over the years. I think you'll find this interesting. John Polkinghorn is a physicist and an Anglican priest. And he writes, the universe is a work of art. It is a beautiful and complex creation. This creation is evidence of a creator. Francis Collins, the former head of the Nas National Institutes of Health, the NIH, famous for mapping the human genome and DNA, said this, the universe is not just a place, it is a message. The message is that we are loved and that we have a purpose. That's Francis Collins, renowned, respected scientist, still alive today. Sir Joseph Thompson, Nobel Prize winning physicist, recognized as the founder of atomic physics. I don't even know what atomic physics is, except I can guess it had to do with the bombs and stuff. But as we conquer peak after peak, we see in front of us regions full of interest and beauty. But we do not see our goal. We do not see the horizon. In the distant tower, still higher peaks, which will yield to those who ascend them, still wider prospects and deepen, deepen the feeling, the truth of which is emphasized by every advance in science, that great are the works of the Lord. Physicist and chemist Robert Boyle, who is considered the founder of modern chemistry. When I was a high school student forced to take chemistry, this would not have been a plus in his column for me. But I will accept that he's smart. Robert Boyle said, God is the author of the universe and the free establisher of the laws of motion. Physicist Paul Davies, winner of the Kelvin Medal and the Faraday Prize, said, people take it for granted that the physical world is both ordered and intelligible. The underlying order in nature, the laws of physics, are simply accepted as given, as brute facts. Nobody asks where they come from. At least they do not do so in polite company. He's talking about his scientific colleagues. However, even the most atheistic scientist accepts as an act of faith that the universe is not absurd, that there is a rational basis to physical existence manifested as law-like order, law-like order in nature that is at least partly comprehensible to us. So science can proceed, this, get this, science can proceed only if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. You want to go back in time a bit? I give you Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton said this, in the absence of any other proof, the thumb alone would convince me of God's existence. Newton actually in his day was respected as much as being a theologian as a scientist. He actually did a lot of great writing and works in theology, and he wrote this, among many things, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God, written by those who were inspired. I study the Bible daily. That's Newton, who's considered to be the greatest scientist in history. Now, of course, many people will say, well, that's fine, that's fine. You Christians can believe your truth, that's great. So based on your lived experience and based on how you see things, it's true for you. But it's not true for me. Okay. I understand and appreciate the fact that all of us here have different experiences and backgrounds. And those experiences and backgrounds shape our mental and emotional health and equilibrium and all that. I get that. I understand that. But reality is reality. 
truth is truth. It's not like people were floating around until the apple fell on Isaac Newton's head. And then Isaac Newton discovers gravity and everyone goes back to the earth all of a sudden. You know, just because gravity had not been discovered does not mean gravity did not exist. Reality is reality. There are things that I've never been, just so you know, some of you might wonder, I'm not a Martian, I've never been to Mars. But I know Mars exists. I've seen it in the movie Mars Attacks, so I know it exists, all right? I know Mars exists. So don't do this nonsense, it's true for you, but not for me. I can't stand that. And this, I'm sorry to offend, this ridiculous, stupid, moronic, postmodernist garbage that so many people are affected by today. It's not your truth, my truth, whatever. There is the truth. Truth is objective, it is absolute. Now our relationship to the truth may be relative, but truth is truth, whether we like it or not. Genesis 1.1 is an objective fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was an uh, English philosopher, biologist, sociologist, and anthropologist. He did, he did all this stuff. He's a smart guy. His name is Herbert Spencer. And he was actually uh, a staunch evolutionist. He loved Darwin. Red Origin of Species was an expert on that. He coined the phrase survival of the fittest. So Spencer was not a Christian. But Spencer theorized, um, one of his ideas was first principles, and he theorized that all phenomena could be explained through continuous interplay of what he referred to as the five categories of the knowable. Now keep in mind, scientists since his day have recognized there's now dark matter, dark energy, other dimensions and stuff, so this, this is not quoted as much now. So we're just focusing on what we can see again, and we'll, that what we can see points to what we cannot, what we cannot see. But he says the five categories of the knowable are space, time, matter, motion, or force, and power. Space, time, matter, motion, force, or power. So now consider Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, time. God, that's your force. Created, there's your action. The heavens, space, and the earth, matter. So even... <laughs> The inspired scripture, going back to the very first verse of the Bible, knew something before even Herbert Spencer discovered it. We live in God's cathedral. And we need to recognize that fact. And because of that, our faith can be strong. There should be no such thing as a Christian with weak faith. Philip Hughes says in his commentary on the epistle of Hebrews, faith not only makes the future promises present, it unveils the unseen. So it's by your faith that you understand that. Martin Luther King defined faith as faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. When you pray, listen to me, when you pray and you've got a burden on your heart and God tells you to pray for it, please remember, you are praying to the creator of the universe. This creator of the universe is more than capable of answering your prayer. And just because you don't see a way that he can answer that prayer does not mean God can't see a way to answer that prayer. Just because you don't see how life could get any better for you or how your marriage could get any better or how your child could get any better I know many of you are like, oh, my child is perfect. <laughs> we'll talk about delusions on a com upcoming Sunday. Um, but there's a lot of people I've talked with, counseled with over the years. Their, child's, their children have walked away from Christianity, walked away from the faith. And they're wondering, how in the world can I get my child back? Well, first of all, it's not up to you. You are not God. None of us here is qualified to be God. God does a much better job of being God than any human being does. And in fact, I could trace almost all the world's problems are due to people trying to be God. That job is taken, and it's taken by the one most qualified. But you can pray to that God. You can pray to him, and you can trust him. And you can trust that God loves your child even more than you do. 
But if you don't appreciate the fact that there is a creator behind all this, it's going to be hard for you to have that faith. When I drove up, when Jane and I drove in this morning, we saw a little Benjamin Park chasing a rabbit. I think the rabbit got away. But scientists today would say that little Benjamin and the rabbit share, well, excuse me, atheistic scientists would say that Benjamin and the rabbit share a common ancestor. You know, it's kind of like that view from the goo to the zoo to you kind of thing. Um, I know that's simplistic because, you know, I get it, but it's still funny. Um, I don't believe Benjamin and the rabbit share a common ancestor, but I do believe they share a common creator. And so Benjamin's parents can pray to that common creator for their son and their daughter Naomi. You don't want to leave Naomi out. So. And there's power in that prayer because there's power in the one who we're praying to. Faith acknowledges the worlds were framed by the word of God and that recognizes that God is a God of immense power. If you understand that this universe is here because of God and that we are here because of God, then you understand what Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. George Washington Carver, one of my favorite heroes in history, the pioneer in agricultural chemistry, Carver said, without my Savior, I am nothing. The Lord has guided me. He has shown me the way, just as he will show everyone who turns to him. I want to close by telling a story of a scientist who worked for Nazi Germany. Uh, his name, Werner von Braun. How many of you have heard of him? Now, people will say, I'm not a rocket scientist. Von Braun was actually a rocket scientist, which means extremely smart. He was a nominal Lutheran for his uh, growing up and everything, but didn't really believe. In fact, his friends called him a merry heathen. So that's the kind of lifestyle he had. He just didn't take God seriously. And Hitler came to power. He got swept up in Hitler's Germany for the Nazi party. He went to work for Hitler's war machine. He was responsible for building the V1 and V2 rockets that were used to bomb civilians in London. Uh, and then toward the end of the war, he became disillusioned with Hitler and, and the Nazis and everything, so much so that the Gestapo viewed him with suspension and at one point even locked him up. In 1945, he organized the surrender of about 500 of his fellow scientists to the Allies. But von Braun was still not a Christian. He saw Hitler for the evil man that he was. He saw Nazi Germany for the failed state that it was, but he still didn't really believe. Well, he gets pressed into service by the U.S. government because, you know, the, this was the Cold War was now kicking off. The space race was kicking off, starting to. Um, von Braun was an expert. So von Braun escaped uh, the Nuremberg trials and all that because he was pressed into service by the U.S. government. Historians can debate the morality and ethics of that. That's not for our purposes here. But von Braun uh, was invited by a friend to a church, a small Texas church in 1946. He goes to this church, and the Lord got a hold of him. And according to von Braun's diary, he accepted Christ as his Savior. Now, some people today question the sincerity of that. Well, von Braun just did that because he was trying to... Well, he had already escaped punishment. He didn't have anything to really to gain by this. And I also want to say that um, I know many people get cynical uh, on when, when people accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, but I want you to know history is full of thieves, murderers, conquerors, and ne'er-do-wells who accepted Christ as their Savior and saw him turn their life around. Now, either we believe in a Jesus who saves sinners or we don't. I believe Jesus is in the life-changing business. And if Jesus can save a slave trader like John Newton and lead him to write the most beloved Christian hymn of all time, Amazing Grace, 
then Jesus can save you and me. It's from the, the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Newton meant that. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He wrote those words as he was going blind, physically. Um, and uh, one of the things that he said is, uh, I am a great sinner. Christ is a great Savior. I believe Jesus saved arch segregationist George Wallace. His testimony is clear from his family that, that uh, he changed. Jesus saved a guy named Saul of Tarsus who murdered Christians. Saved him. I want you to know God, and I believe this, God has more mercy than people do. Don't trust in yourself. And there's a lot of people that it's like, I can never forgive this person for that. Well, God can. My faith is strong in my creator and my faith is strong in the word of God. Don't be so sanctimonious and bitter and self-righteous that you can't accept that God loves sinners and has sent his son Jesus to die for them. I believe Jesus saved sinners, and I do accept Von Braun and his word. I believe Jesus saved him in spite of the fact that at one point in his life, before Christ, he worked for the evil Nazi war machine. So when Von Braun accepted Christ, Von Braun's whole outlook on life changed. And uh, Von Braun began to see everything differently. At one point he writes, scientific concepts exist only in the minds of men. Behind these concepts lies the reality which is being revealed to us, but only by the grace of God. At one point he wrote, an outlook at the vast mysteries of the universe should only confirm our belief in the certainty of its creator. In uh, later years, toward the end of his life, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he was asked to uh, speak at this event, but his health wouldn't allow him to do it, so he was asked to write his remarks out. His remarks became, were published as a foreword to a science book that came out just like a month before he died. In that foreword, this is what Von Braun wrote. In this reaching of the new millennium, he wrote this in the early 1970s, as we're approaching the 21st century. In this reaching of the new millennium, through faith in the words of Jesus Christ, science can be a valuable tool rather than an impediment. The universe, as revealed through scientific in inquiry, is the living witness, living witness that God has indeed been at work. Understanding the nature of the creation provides a substantive basis for the faith by which we attempt to know the nature of the creator. I want to ask you, what is your faith like this morning? Is your faith based on your circumstances or based on your feelings or based on your emotions or based on all of that? Or is your faith based on the power of the almighty God who created this entire universe and is responsible for you? You are God's handiwork. You and the person next to you and this universe in which we live in is God's handiwork and God's masterpiece. And God is worthy of your faith and, and your trust. But you must decide whether you're willing to put your faith and trust in God. And if you are here today and don't know where you stand in your faith, I encourage you, please come see me or Pastor Charles Bailey after we conclude this service. Werner Von Braun is buried in Ivy Hill Cemetery in Alexandria, Virginia. Engraved on his tombstone is a passage of scripture. It's just a reference, not the writing of the scripture, but just a reference. And that reference, it just says on his tombstone, I looked at a picture of it, before I preached here today, Psalm 19, verse 1. If you look up Psalm 19 and verse 1, it says this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Trust in the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for, uh, for your glory. 
I thank you for the evidence of your handiwork. If there's anyone here today that has questions about their faith, something they're burdened about, or just questions about their relationship with you in general, I pray that they will seek me out today after this service. If anyone has questions about baptism, church membership, or any other issue, I pray that they will also seek me out and talk to me after this service. Father, I pray that you will impress upon each person here, myself included, we do not need to pray in doubt or in fear. We can pray in faith. We are not praying to a dead idol. We are praying to a living Savior. And we are praying to the one who created this entire universe. Strengthen our faith as we leave today. It's in Jesus' name I pray this prayer. Amen. I, uh,